The Sound of Music is one of those films that many of us have seen numerous times. Since it was released in 1965, it's been shown on TV again and again, usually around Christmas time. And it's become such a part of our lives that during the Cold War, the BBC over in, this, in Britain, they organised this, that this film would be included in a programme list that would play on a loop from a secret bunker in an event of a, a nuclear strike. So that if you were sheltering from a, a, a nuclear winter, that you could at least watch The Sound of Music. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Make all the difference in the world. Now, we might think this sickly sweet movie has got nothing to do with a very raw and very challenging book of Job that we've been studying. But it actually turns out that it does have a connection. In this movie, after the captain declares his love for Maria, she sings a song, as they do in musicals. And the song's called Something Good. I'm not going to sing it to you, don't worry. But it says this. Perhaps I had a wicked childhood. Perhaps I had a miserable youth. But somewhere in my wicked, miserable past, there must have been a moment of truth. For here you are standing there loving me, whether or not you should. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. Nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. So somewhere in my youth or childhood, I must have done something good. Now, I don't know if Job's three friends would have enjoyed the sound of music. But they certainly agreed with the sentiment of that song. When they heard about Job's suffering, they came to sympathise with him, to comfort him. And so they sat silently with him for a week, allowing, waiting for Job to speak first and to express the depth of his pain. But then they spoke, each of them in three cycles of very lengthy speeches. Each time, Job responded and challenged what they said, but they weren't listening. And they were, they pushed further and further into their strongly held view, hoping to convince Job. And so what was their argument? What was the basic thing they were saying? Well, it was just like what Maria sang. It was, nothing comes from nothing. Blessings, they come from personal goodness. Suffering, well that comes from personal sin. And it's a very popular idea today. There are even some Christians who think that this is how the world works. But this morning I want us to see just how wrong that is. How it is a dangerous and harmful twisting of biblical truth. So we're not going to look at all 24 chapters of this argument this morning. You'll be very glad to hear. But we're just going to try and dip into a little bit. The first of those speeches. To see what these guys were saying and why what they were saying was so wrong when they said nothing comes from nothing. So we're going to read from Job chapter 4. So if you have a Bible, please do open it. Job chapter 4, we're going to read from verse 1 to verse 9 first of all. And Jason's going to come and he's going to read for us. Then Eliphaz the Temanite replied, If someone ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? But who can keep from speaking? Think how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. But now trouble comes on you. You are discouraged. It strikes you and you are dismayed. Should not your piety be your confidence and your blameless ways be your hope? Consider now who being innocent has ever perished. Where were the uprights ever destroyed? As I have observed, those who plough in evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God they perish, 
At the blast of his anger, they are no more. Thank you very much, Jason. When Lauren and I started going out together, she came around to our house for dinner with my family. And as usual, we were just having a really lively discussion about some issue or whatever around the dinner table, as we did most nights. But Lorna was quite alarmed. She just quietly sat there eating her dinner because she thought we were having some blazing row. But we were just discussing a really important issue. So it's possible to think that some people are having an argument when other people are just having a conversation. It depends, I guess, on your family culture about how loud that, art, that can, conversation can get. But I don't think that's what's happening here with Job and his friends. What is described over these 24 chapters is clearly an argument with a really abrasive comments and angry exchanges. And they got really personal in their attack. Now, in his speech, Eliphaz was, a, his first speech anyway, Eliphaz was a little bit more, a little bit more subtle, a little bit more guarded in his criticisms. But even here, he started in a pretty combative way. Look at verse 2 again. This is how he started. If someone ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? But who can keep from speaking? Job had just poured out his heart to them in an incredible lament that we looked at last week. And Eliphaz's response is to immediately go on the attack and accuse him him of being impatient. Something like, can I say something, or are you going to bite my head off? Not a very nice way to start a conversation. And then he continued, verse 3, Think how you you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands. Your words have supported those who stumble, and you have strengthened faltering knees, but now trouble comes to you. And you are discouraged. It strikes you. And you are dismayed. This is like one of those backhanded compliments. What's going on, Job? Eliphaz was saying. You've been so good at counselling others when they get into trouble. But now you're the one in trouble and you're falling apart. Come on, get a grip. This was bad enough. But like most arguments, as it got, it got worse, as you got along further and further into it. And then when a fourth friend turned up, a guy called Elihu, things got even more heated. Elihu was just angry, angry with Job, but also angry with his three friends for not being able to uh, convince Job. And change their mind, change his mind. A couple of weeks ago, we were really impressed by these three friends who'd set out from their home and travelled that distance to come and to mourn with Job, to sit down in the ashes with him. But how quickly all their good intentions disappeared. And this visit just descended into an argument filled with frustration and anger. And yet, isn't that what it's all often like? You ever been in a conversation like that? You started off going there to try to help, to encourage. But then when that person didn't listen to what we were saying... Or they didn't, they were, they challenged our ideas. Or their experience goes against our strongly held convictions. Well, we're tempted. We're tempted to get a little bit more argumentative. A little bit abrasive. A little bit angry. So Paul, the Apostle Paul, he, he counseled Timothy. He said this, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Don't have anything to do with that. 
Because you know that they just produce quarrels. Arguments don't do anybody any good. When we get angry, when we get abrasive, when we go on the personal attack, we're no longer speaking as God wants us to. Because we're no longer speaking with love. This is what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues, <coughs> excuse me, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Now don't be offended if you play the gong or play the cymbal, but most of us don't like that noise. It's not a pleasant noise. It's not an encouraging noise. It's just noise. That's what we're like if we just go on the tack and speak without love. So as Christians, we are called to be people who are committed to speaking the truth in love. Not to keep silent because people really need to hear the truth. So we need to be courageous enough to speak the truth. But we need to speak that truth carefully. Because we always need to share it in a loving way. We need to speak God's truth with God's love. But these guys, they didn't just go wrong in how they spoke. That was bad enough. But they also went wrong in what they said. This is what Elphaz said in verse 6. Should not your piety be your confidence and your blameless ways your hope? Elphaz believed that if Job was living a godly life, <coughs> excuse me, if Job was living a godly life, then he had nothing to fear. His piety, his blamelessness would be his assurance that everything's going to work out okay. Everything's going to be fine. Why was Eliphaz sure of that? Well, because he said, verse 7, who being innocent has ever perished? Where were the upright ever destroyed? This was Eliphaz's assumption. This was his and his friends' strongly held conviction. The good in this world, they said, never lose out in this world. The righteous, they are never wiped out. They will always be blessed. And then in contrast, the other side of that is the wicked will always perish. The evil will always be punished. That's what happens in this world. According to Eliphaz and his friends. And they believed that they had strong evidence for this conviction. First, Eliphaz claimed that this is what he had observed. This is what he had seen. Verse 8, as I have observed, those who plough evil and those who sow trouble reap it. At the breath of God they are destroyed, at the blast of his anger they perish. Now I know that these guys didn't have all the advantages that we have of, of technology so we can get news. News 24 hours a day, instant news of what's happening all over this world. But I'm not really sure how they could claim that at all. Because that's not what we see in this world, is it? The evidence is clearly on the side of another guy who's writing in the Bible, a guy called Asaph, who nearly fell away from his faith because, not because he saw evil people being destroyed or evil people being punished, but he saw evil people prospering. This is what he says in Psalm 73, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph struggled in his faith because he was seeing people who had no time for God doing really well. And 
he was really struggling. But Eliphaz wasn't just relying on his observations for this conviction. He also claimed that this was the commonly held view of wise people. This is what he says in verse 10 of chapter 15. The grey-haired and the aged are on our side. Men even older than your father. I guess grey hair means you're supposed to have a little bit of wisdom. Not so sure about that, but that's the, that's the idea. And so Eliphaz was claiming that all the people who had that, that better wisdom, they were the ones who were on his side. But the question is, even if that was true, when has the popular view in this world been the correct one? When has the majority been right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? But Eliphaz and his friends, they didn't just look to human sources for this belief. They also claimed spiritual ones too. Later in chapter 4, Eliphaz claimed to have some strange mystical experience when a, when a spirit revealed this truth to him. Listen to what he says in Job chapter 4, verse 12. A word was secretly brought to me. My ears caught a whisper of it. Amid disquieting dreams in the night, when deep sleep falls on men, fear and trembling seized me and made all my bones shake. A spirit glided past my face. And the hair on my body stood an end. It stopped, but I could not tell what it was. A form stood before my eyes. And I heard a hushed voice. Sounds a bit more like a Halloween story, doesn't it? But some people claim that their beliefs come from a personal, supernatural encounter. An angelic message. A word from the Lord. But Paul said, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. We're not supposed to be guided by people's supposedly supernatural experiences. That isn't supposed to have the authority in our lives. Eliphaz claimed that he'd observed this, that it was popular view, that it was what the the Spirit told him. But ultimately his view, I think, was based on his, his theology, his understanding, his belief about God. Eliphaz and his friends were believers in God. Bildad, he started his first speech, that was another one of those guys, by declaring this. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? These three men rightly believed in the sovereignty of God over this world. And they also rightly believed that God is absolutely just and absolutely fair. That everything he does is right and true. But these two properly held beliefs led them to an assumption. If God is in control, and God is absolutely just, then life in this world will reflect that justice. Life will look just, because God is in control and God is just. So God will always reward virtue and God will always punish vice. Nothing comes from nothing. If you're suffering, it's because of personal sin. If you're blessed, it's because of personal goodness. Well, as I've mentioned before, this book in the Bible is, is recognized as being probably the oldest book of the Bible. It goes back hundreds, thousands of years. And yet, 
what Eliphaz and his friends were saying is remarkably similar to an increasingly popular view today. The prosperity gospel says that God will ensure that everyone who trusts in him will have lives full of health and wealth and happiness. And that view is growing in popularity across the world. Over in the States, a recent study claimed that 76%, nearly three quarters of Christians, believe that God wants them to prosper financially. That's what people are starting to believe. That's what Satan thought Job believed. Satan accused Job of just worshipping God because he thought it would guarantee him material blessings. The Job is just in it for the cash. But despite all the claimed evidence for their beliefs, Eliphaz and his friends were wrong. They were very eloquent. They wrote a lot. They said a lot. But they were wrong. And you don't just need to take my word for it. We can take God's word for it. In Job chapter 42, God said to Eliphaz, You have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Their assumption was unfounded. It may have matched their observations, or the popular views, or their mystical experiences. It may have made logical sense in their theology, but it didn't match with God's word. Now, of course, there's an element of truth in what they were saying. That's the case with, all, with most false teaching. As I said before, false teaching is more dangerous the more truth that it contains. Because it draws people into it. And this truth has, an, has, has a lot of truth as part of it. There is a reward for virtue and a punishment for vice. Paul said this in Galatians chapter 6. He said this, God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. A man reaps what he sows. But what Eliphaz and his friends went wrong in was the timing of this. God calls his people to wait for his blessings. Because ultimately they don't come in this life. This is what Jesus did. He waited. So Hebrews chapter 12. If you remember we looked at this a, a couple of months ago. Hebrews chapter 12 calls us to fix our eyes on Jesus. The author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the, the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes, Jesus was exalted to the highest place to sit beside his Father in heaven, but that was only after going through the cross. Suffering now, Exaltation later. So yes, living for God is absolutely worth it. Trusting in Jesus will always bless us. But Job's friends were wrong. The prosperity gospel is wrong. Satan is wrong. Those blessings are not health, wealth and happiness now. They're better than that. Their blessings in eternity for, for the life that is to come. This is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 9. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me 
will save us. But not only was their assumption wrong, it was also dangerous. And it was also incredibly cruel. If good people are blessed in this world and wicked people suffer, then it's logical to conclude that Job was wicked because he was suffering. In fact, Job was suffering more than most people have ever suffered, so Job must be the most wicked man around. Eliphaz, he hinted at that throughout his his first speech. But he and his friends became more direct, more cruel as that argument developed. They even spelled out a whole host of things that Job had done wrong. Not because they had any evidence for that, but just because it was based on their assumption. They were making it up. So Job chapter 22, verse 5, Is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? You demanded security from your brothers for no reason. You stripped men of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave, water, you gave no water to the weary and you withheld food from the hungry. Accusation after accusation after accusation. And none of them were found in anything apart from their previous assumption. And they were wrong. Again, we don't need to take just somebody else's word for it. We can say, well, what does God think about Job? Well, we saw that in the early chapters, didn't we? Twice, God said that Job was blameless and upright. A man who fears God and shuns evil. So Job was suffering as an innocent person. This was an unfair accusation. And that's cruel enough. But I think it gets worse with with these guys. He even said that this is explaining why his kids, Job's ten children, had died. Job chapter 8, he said this, When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. See, Job, this is the reason why your kids are dead. Because they were terrible people. I don't think the teachers of the prosperity gospel would ever say that kind of thing. I don't think they would be so cruel. But this is the logical conclusion of their teaching. If you're suffering, sick, or struggling to make ends meet, it must be because of some sin in your life. Some lack of faith. It's actually what Jesus' disciples thought. I don't know if you remember in John chapter 9. They were walking along and they met a guy who had been born blind. And this is the question that the disciples asked. Who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? See their question? Who's to blame here, Jesus? Somebody must have sinned because that guy was born blind. So somebody must have caused it. Was it it him or was it his parents before him? But Jesus rejected that cruel and destructive idea. He declared neither this man or his parents sinned. But this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. But I think ultimately it's the cross of Jesus that shows how wrong this idea really is. When people looked at Jesus dying in agony and shame on the cross, they concluded that this was proof that Jesus was a fraud. That he was guilty before God. So Isaiah 53 says, We considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. They thought they were absolutely confirmed that Jesus could not have been the Son of God. He could not have been a good man. He could not have been a godly man because he died in such agony and shame. But of course they were wrong. Jesus is completely sinless. 
Instead, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So the teaching of Job's friends and the prosperity gospel that reflects that doesn't only falsely accuse suffering people today. Ultimately, it condemns Jesus, our suffering Savior. But it doesn't only give the the wrong diagnosis of suffering. It also gives the wrong solution to it. At the end of his first speech, this is what Eliphaz said in chapter 5, verse 17. Blessed is the man whom God corrects. So do not despise the the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, but his hands also heal. If Job's suffering was all because of his own sin, then all he had to do was repent. Turn away from his wrongdoing and everything will be okay. His prosperity would return. He'd be protected from danger. His family would grow again. That's what they said. It was a simple answer, a simplistic solution to his problem. But it gave false hope. Just like some people today promise that if you want to be healed... If you want to get out of debt, if you want to have a good life, then all you need to do is have more faith. Or pray a special prayer. Or go to their church. Or give them some of your money. But the answer to suffering and struggles in this world is not like this. There isn't something simple that we can do to guarantee us a pain-free life. And we have Jesus' word on that. Jesus said to his disciples, in this world you will have trouble. So the answer to the suffering and the struggle in this world is not some simple way to try and avoid it. Rather, it's a deep and meaningful way to work through it. That's what we need. And that's what God offers to us. He encourages us to trust in His purpose and His plan for our lives. To depend on His goodness and His grace. To hold on to His promise that He is with us even in the darkest of valleys in our lives. To trust that He is working for our good even when we cannot see it. To hold on that one day He will rescue us from it all so that our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Not to give us a life of health, wealth and happiness for a few years here on earth. But to give us a life of knowing Jesus. Living for Him. Becoming more and more like Him. And ultimately, of living with Him forever. For all eternity. Folks, we need something far better than Eliphaz and his friends' ideas. We don't need their unexpected arguments filled with anger. But we need God's truth spoken in love. Not their unfounded assumption that nothing comes from nothing, but God's word which calls us to take up our cross and to follow Christ. 
Not the unfair accusation of those who say that we're always to blame for our suffering. But God's grace, paid for by the cross of Christ. And not the unhelpful answers of those who claim to guarantee prosperity now. But God's purpose and plan for us that we will share in the eternal glory of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ.